people, let's start. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I think I know many people on the list. My name is Desiree Lewis, and I'm the principal researcher for the Critical Food Studies program. And um, I'll, I'll post a website link so that you can find out more about it. So yeah, this virtual panel discussion, welcome to it, which deals broadly with students' access to and experiences of food and eating. So we have six speakers today. I hope that um, they will all be able to connect, which is of course a large number for a panel, but the issue is of course a large one and one that needs to foreground the knowledge and experiences of students themselves. World Food Day was on Friday the 16th of October, and it seems crucial for university campus communities to mark the day by focusing on how food and eating are experienced by our main campus citizens, students. One aim of this discussion is to share knowledge, information and experiences from different perspectives, and especially from the perspectives of students. Hunger experienced by university students is of course not a recent phenomenon. Although it is only fairly recently that some South African universities have addressed this through advocacy research, uh, planning and programs. So each of the panelists who will be introduced by Mary Hames, my co-moderator, will confront different questions. These include what are the institutional and national contexts in which students access and eat food? What sorts of political and practical strategies would support students' positive experiences of food and eating? And what in fact do we mean by positive experiences? Very often uh, the idea of what it means to be have a positive experience is defined by the experts. And it's particularly important, the so-called experts, um, which is why it's particularly important to have students themselves on a panel like this. Another question is who should take responsibility for these strategies? And how can we build campus-wide awareness of the politics of food systems as these affect students? rather than treat students' hunger as a standalone issue. So four of the six speakers, hopefully, if they, they're here on time, are UWC students with food activist experiences on and off campus. As academic staff, the two other speakers have driven advocacy research around students' food, food access and rights. And because of the focus on UWC perspectives, um, it's anticipated that this discussion will help to drive collaborative, political and practical ventures at this university. But of course, the attention to principles, ethics and, um, and politics are of course also relevant to other universities. So I want to hand over to Dr. Mary Haynes, Director of the Gender Equity Unit, which has long been involved in struggles for students' rights, including their rights to food. And just to mention that as people are speaking, people will speak in consecutive order. So um, as they are speaking, please feel free to use the chat uh, facility for questions and comments. And Mary and I will coordinate this after the speakers present. Thank you. I'll hand over to Mary now. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Desiree. I will be introducing the um, oh, good morning every, or oh, good afternoon, everyone. I will be introducing the uh, speakers one by one, so to give them context for what they are going to speak about, and, and seeing that we are waiting on, on some of the speakers to join us. So the first speaker is Dumpo Macapella, who is also a colleague of mine, and she's working, uh, she's responsible for our student project. She was also involved when she was a full-time student at UWC. Um, with the, the, the food program. And currently, she is actually responsible for shaping the food program that we have been running since 2006 at the Equity Unit. She recently received an award, uh, a creative award for a work on, on script writing and writing about and, and, and directing um, educational dramas around food. And um, she will be talking on, on the uh, prevailing socioeconomic conditions and, and the landscapes 
that exists at the different universities, and in particular, the influence of class and education on food cultures at university. She'll be also um, speaking on food injustice instead of food justice, as most people do. Thank you, Dimpo. Over to you. Thank you, <laughs> Andre. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as Andre just mentioned, I, I work at the Gender Equity Unit, um, but before um, I was a volunteer there as well. And um, I've been working for, for quite some time um, as a volunteer with the food program. Um, at the Gender Equity Unit Department, which is one of the first and the oldest food initiative um, programs within the University of the Western Cape. So the thing about um, just a little insight around the food program, the food program was basically a, a program that assisted with not just only assisting students that were food insecure, but also um, providing awareness and education around food insecurity within the University of the Western Cape landscape, but also looking at aspects outside of the university that could be playing a role with food insecurity within the University of the Western Cape. And the approach that the food program took about with regards to this was the um, one can give one can phrase where it looked at how one student um, or staff could basically donate one um, non-perishable food items so that once it was all collected, we could provide it to students who do not have access. The other thing that the food program also focused on was how to do so in a very dignified manner, because often um, we would find ourselves or we would witness how some food initiatives would allow people to queue in order to receive access. And not a lot of people very comfortable with that kind of approach in terms of dealing with um, food insecurity. So we constantly had to find very dignified ways to, you know, provide access, but also provide or uh, promote a form of culture around generosity within the University of the Western Cape. Um, and over the years, we have seen with the University of the Western Cape that there has been a lot of initiatives that have started, especially after the first wave of Beast Must Fall within the university in which students had brought to the forefront that food insecurity is indeed a reality within the University of the Western Cape. And while there is an expectation for students to excel in the, in the, in the academic arena, um, but how could they do so without um, having access to food and having access to food that was also nutritious to their body? bodies as well, right? So um, that's just um, an insight with regards to the food initiative within um, the Gender Equity Unit Department within the University of the Western Cape. So I'll be focusing on what students eat by reflecting on who our students are, as this informs us on our socioeconomic landscape reality. And this reality then also informs us on the form of lifestyle they are able to access in terms of their food in, um, education and their lifestyle. I would also like to unpack my reflection on how this impacts the university landscape, zoning in on our dining halls and the food culture promoted within the University of the Western Cape. There was a study, a questionnaire that was completed by 476 learners, um, which ranged between the grades of grade seven and grade 10 um, in, in 14 different schools within the Cape Town area. Um, these schools did take into consideration the various ethnic groups and socioeconomic strata of the population of these schools. And in this questionnaire, upon the investigation of firstly, um, the kind of learners that have access to foods within these schools and in terms of what they were educated on in terms of what is healthy, what is healthy foods and what is unhealthy foods. So the outcome of this questionnaire have established that 77.8% of learners had breakfast before school, which 79.7% .7 of them ate at school and 41% of 6% bought food to school in which 69.3% of the learners um, purchase schools, um, purchase food from these schools. Now, given the statistical information, they wanted to unpack, okay, 
these choices that these learners were making in their schools, um, what of those, um, what, how were their choices structured in terms of what was healthy and what was unhealthy or what they had access to at that particular moment. Now, the reason why I'm going um, back to the learners um, within the Cape Town setting, particularly focusing on this question is that we don't miraculously have um, students at the university, they just, they just don't appear. So they come from um, various spaces in terms of nationality or they are from different provinces and um, their cultures and religious background also, you know, um, influences a lot of the decisions around their food choices, but also the socioeconomic standing informs the, what they have access to and what they have access to also informs their decisions in terms of the kind of lifestyle they want to live. So with regards to the questionnaire, it was established that the students who brought food to school, um, majority of them brought unhealthy foods, while um, a small amount of them brought healthy foods. And among the students who had purchased food, 70% of the, um, the choice in terms of what they, were pu they purchased, 70% of it was unhealthy, whereas 73.2% of, of the students who purchased healthy options, um, they had two or more items that were unhealthy options. And then these learners were presented with information on six different types of food in which they had to categorize which ones were healthy and which ones were unhealthy. And then it was established that 84% of them correctly identified healthy foods where the rest weren't able to identify which foods were healthy and which foods were unhealthy. So the, the conclusion of the questionnaire has established that um, learners who attended schools of high socioeconomic status were twice as likely to bring food to school, who scored higher marks on the quiz of healthy versus unhealthy foods, and were no, no more likely to purchase healthy foods. So the, the reality is, despite them being of a better socioeconomic standing, they tend to um, navigate towards purchasing and unhealthy options. But this could also be as a result of what was made accessible at the school at the particular moment, right? So now the reason why I wanted to touch into, despite the demographic being that of the 14 schools within the Western Cape area, that kind of information also speaks about the socioeconomic landscape and of the country, which then also informs the kind of lifestyle we live in terms of the foods we consume and the foods we have access to, because the phrase goes, we are what we eat. So the socioeconomic, uh, so our socioeconomic landscape in the South African context is that 2.5 million citizens have reported um, to not have access to a, an adequate amount of food, right? So that means that um, within our tertiary institutions, because our tertiary institutions, they don't operate in isolation from the realities of our communities. The university is a community within a community, and therefore, um, what happens within our community seeps into our universities as well. So there has been some research that has been conducted that has established that many of our South African tertiary institutions have discovered that there are a lot of students who are hungry within our university. And those students who do eat, the options, majority of them, their options tend to be of low to no nutritional value in terms of the foods that they are consuming within the university, uh, within the tertiary institution landscape. So students identified undergoing hunger were those with poor backgrounds and low quantile schools, and those who were often the first generation of students within their families to go to university. Now this information is quite important because it kind of speaks to also the kind of responsibilities that students um, navigate with within the university space. A study was conducted with regards to looking at the statistics at two universities, um, one being the University of the Free State, which 64.5% um, of the students were food insecure, and the University of KwaZulu-Natal, where 55% of the students who are from low income families were food insecure. And the reason why specifically within the University of Kosovo Natal, um, why these students were food in insecure, they had discovered that the students were actually utilizing the financial aid that they were receiving to not just feed themselves, but to feed their families as well. 
And that's why I speak about the responsibility that students from this demographic are experiencing or navigating within the university context that the, the responsibility is not just the academic responsibility, but even with the little support that they have or the kind of support that they have, be it from the, the government funds um, in terms of um, financial aid, but also with regards to the scholarships that they receive or the stipends that they receive, they often tend to use a lot of those funds to feed not just themselves, but to feed their families, the entire families as well. And from the food program initiative, um, we've also established this information to be quite true, that the students that we were assisting, um, when we found out what, what, what caused their food insecurity is that, yes, they are on financial aid, but the financial aid is, especially if they're living off campus, is that the, the stipend that I'm receiving is to travel, to navigate to school back and forth. One, two, I'm not living alone. I'm not living on reason. Therefore, I am feeding my family because I'm obligated to feed my, feed my family. I can't just live with my family and feed myself. Um, there are other mouths in the household that I need to attend to. So that was kind of the reality um, with the kind of students that we were assisting. So class and education, um, nutritious food is essential for healthy and productive living. However, many people are unable to access food due to physical, social, and economic, economic barriers. This again speaks to the socioeconomic landscape that we find ourselves within the South African context. Personal choices are reflected by personal circumstances and the personal is political. And therefore we should consider intersectional factors that not only inform what students have access to, but the choices made with their level of access. So now I'm going to look into the whole university reality because um, for me personally, it hasn't just been about, you know, there's food insecurity, we need to food this, feed the students. But my question was also, what are we feeding our students as well? What is made accessible within the university landscape as well? The thing is, when I wanted to investigate or ask myself, when we look at the what we're feeding our students, we need to also look at who we are feeding in on our campuses because as i mentioned before the university is a community within a community and a diverse one at that because we have people from different nationalities different provinces um, different socioeconomic backgrounds in terms of class then it's also the whole religious and cultural backgrounds as well that needs to be taken into consideration race and we can go as far as um, exploring gender gender identity and um, sexual orientation as well so those kind of intersectionalities does influence a lot on our, our choices, our lifestyles and how we navigate in various spaces and also what may be available in that particular space. I also took, in, took into consideration upon reflecting on this question is that the university itself is placed in a particular um, geographical location and therefore its geographical location influences the kind of, you know, um, in terms of food wise, what is going to be made accessible to, you know, people that navigate through this space as well. So we know that the University of the Western Cape has a diverse range of, of students, also, um, students as well. And we know where the University of the Western Cape is located as well. And I, when we speak about food and you ask people, okay, food and UWC, what's the first thing you think about? Gatsby's. Now I come from a province where we were exposed to Gatsby's that um, the kind of foods that um, that was quite popular in our communities was spatlos. Um, not too sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, or if any of you are familiar with that kind of food. Um, but um, Gatsby's was introduced to me through um, my my move from the Northern Cape into the Western Cape. So now, given that reality, given the geographical location of the University of the Western Cape, we ask ourselves, okay, what is the food culture? of the University of the Western Cape. Does the University of the Western Cape take into consideration the kind of food promotion or you know, what they, they, they decide to make accessible? Do they take into consideration the diversity within the, the institution? right and and do they accommodate this diversity but also take into consideration that the historical context of the university is that it is a black university you know and um we and given that reality we know the kind of students that come to the university of the west cape and is that con is that consider is that reality taken into consideration with what is being made um, access and available within the university of the west cape now this goes now to the dining halls we do know that UWC had dining halls and they did not have dining halls. Sorry. Oh. 
um, Dimple, you got just one minute. One more minute. Okay, I'm going to round up very quickly. Okay, so just with the dining halls of the University of the Western Cape, we know that they had, and they provided food for students that were living on campus, I believe for everyone. And then as time went by, they no longer had dining halls. But now with the current dining halls that they have, which I'm gonna call restaurants, is that these restaurants um, often don't kind of reflect the demographic within the University of the Western Cape. So you have two freedoms on campus, Liema, which focuses on the African cuisine, which is basically located on the outskirts of the University of the Western Cape. And then you have your Iris restaurant, which um, is actually popular, more associated with Chinese food. So now you ask yourself these questions in terms of the offerings that are made within the University of the Western Cape. Firstly, who does it accommodate? Who is it taking into consideration? And also the price or the cost factor who will have access in order to purchase these foods given the reality of the majority of students that attend the University of the Western Cape. Then we go over to food education and the financial education aspects of it. Students are now, um, especially with how NSPAS is structured differently at this moment, students have access to uh, monetary um, means in terms of their stipends, but also given their location because UWC is located in Balbo, where can they go to access the foods that is more relatable to them, their background, their nationalities, their cultural and religious practices. So I'm going to end there. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Dempo. That was quite a mouthful and I know there's quite a lot to say, but I think we can keep that to the question and answering uh, session. Thanks so much. Uh, the next speaker, I don't see Kenneth, yeah, so I will ask, um, I mean, I don't see C-Sway, but I've, I will go on to Kenneth uh, McClawe, who is also an undergraduate student at UWC, and he is passionately committed to ideas, activism, and critical work around food justice. Kenneth is also interested in aligning progressive ideas with practical strategies for addressing university students' food rights. He's therefore committed to networks, strategies, and activities for addressing the hunger experienced by many students, especially in the context of COVID-19 and its socioeconomic impact. So, Kenneth, over to you. Mute. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I'll be, I'll try and be very short, uh, just to make a few points. Uh, uh, Kenneth, please feel free to not rush too much, especially since these way might not join us. So don't feel too rushed. Uh, okay, okay. okay. Uh, so I guess I'll, 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 I'll try and address some of these things in point form uh, and to, without any further ado, I, I think when it comes to food insecurity, uh, there's a number of points, like one, would I want to address the, the some of the problem in, in general uh, with food insecurity and students on, on campus, and also just briefly uh, talk to, to some of the solutions uh, that as students we've been discussing and trying to, to come up with. So as part of the problems, first we think that you know, food, food insecurity and the question on what, what students are eating, uh, what, what do students eat uh, when they're on campus is that uh, when we look at food insecurity, we must, we must look at it a little bit holistically that for example, no food automatically also means no access for other privileged privileges, for example, uh, uh, resources for transport, uh, money for textbooks, uh, for data, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, no, no food, no access to food, you know, it also means uh, the inability to cope with, with, with academic and intellectual uh, uh, programs and discourses like studies in general, uh, which we all, I think, know that leads also to a to a high rate of, of dropouts uh, to a high rate of failure uh, it also very much uh, leads to 
you know, alcohol, drug abuse, uh, lifestyles in which uh, uh, students, you know, try to blur uh, some of their realities and forget some of the challenges that they are facing within such a context. And, and for those who are able to hold on despite all these odds uh, uh, in terms of uh, food, they drop in their overall academic, you know, uh, excellence or performance and so on. So we would like to emphasize that when we look at the, 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 the issue of food security, we must also look at uh, all the other uh, social aspects that, that is either directly also or indirectly linked to, to the lack, lack of access to food uh, as a student. The second point uh, in terms of the problems is also that the programs, the programs themselves that, uh, that do uh, or at least try to address the issue of food uh, short, shortage and, and, and insecurity are also very problematic. Uh, I feel that uh, some of these programs, they want, they want students to prove uh, their poverty. They want students to prove that you are hungry in order for you to access some of these programs. And this is, in my view, where exactly the othering starts. This is exactly where uh, those people who get to prove themselves uh, uh, to be poverty stricken, this is where uh, uh, that othering, that they become uh, almost like something different from the rest of uh, uh, students that who have the access to, to some of these resources. And, and one of the main issues with, with, with such uh, programs, uh, institution programs, is that uh, uh, it applies kind of like a one size fits all program, you know, uh, to, to to the two questions, to the issues of students. Uh, as the previous speaker said, we are from diverse backgrounds and we are from diverse socioeconomic uh, contexts. So they apply, apply this one size fits all programs that, they, for example, it doesn't take into, into, into consideration the, the economy, the dichotomy of, for example, between students who are off campus and students who are on campus. Uh, it also doesn't take into, into consideration, uh, for example, students who are privately funded and students who are publicly funded. So the programs themselves within, we find that they are very problematic in terms of uh, the pros and programs that are trying to address some of the issues of, 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 of food, food security. And, and although we can, I, I think we can, the list goes on and on uh, in terms of listing the problems about food insecurity and, and the impacts uh, that it has on students and, and, so, and so on and so forth. But I, uh, uh, we also, I think, need to speak more on some of the solutions that come with uh, uh, the, the solutions that we think uh, are, are needed. Myself with uh, 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 other fellow students uh, with uh, CISO as well, uh, we have been uh, uh, discussing and on and off talking about the issue of uh, food insecurity on campus. And one of the, 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 the solutions that we would like to propose is that uh, uh, the university, the institution must start promoting and availing land for food gardens within within the university itself. Because we feel that if, you know, if students can be a part of, like a part of the process uh, to alleviate uh, the lack of access to, to, to food and, in, and food insecurity, uh, bye bye. Uh, it will not only make students a part of that, that process, but students can also do so with a bit of still a dignity left in, 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 in them using their agency, their own agency to alleviate some of their problems. So that's the first, uh, the, the first point that would like to think about, you know, access to small pieces of land for food gardens within, within uh, the campus. The second one is that we also realize uh, uh, that food gardens in and of themselves uh, uh, won't make much of a difference uh, uh, if especially it's not linked to other needs uh, of students on campus. Uh, for example, just to make a, a small example, uh, it doesn't 
how can I, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't help very much if, for example, the financial aid off pays for my tuition, but doesn't care what I eat, where I live, uh, and or how I access the materials or travel to campus. So it must be an integrated view in which uh, uh, accessibility to food must be linked also to the accessibility to studies, to the, uh, to the programs of, of, of studying in and of themselves. And, and everything I say uh, uh, is, is also just based on my own, on my, on my own experiences. Uh, and in conclusion, because I did want to be very, very short and just bring up the main points, I just want to emphasize that it's one thing, you know, to work, uh, continue what you are doing or what is needed in terms of studies, you know, to work and do this on a hungry stomach. You know, it's it's easy to do that. Everyone does that. But I think it's a very different, a totally different situation where most students, when they are hungry, they don't know the next meal will come from. And in a condition where you don't know where the next meal will come from or when that next meal would be, everything else becomes secondary. Even the studies themselves become secondary because uh, a prime, uh, food is a primary uh, a basic need for everyone you know, to, to sustain themselves. So it's not as such that uh, uh, it's only an issue of, 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 of the stomach and what people eat, but it's a fundamental part of the whole process of being a student, of studying and, and so forth. I hope everyone caught my points and this is where I'll conclude for now. Uh, thank you so much, Kenneth. We'll take note of that and I hope the questions are coming on. So the next speaker is Mishka Lewis. And Mishka is an, also an undergraduate at the University of the Western Cape and she's interested in addressing challenges affecting students' well-being on campus with specific attention to students' food access. Like, the, uh, uh, like Kenneth on this panel, panel, she's keen to connect and collaborate with different groups in campus-wide efforts to address and support struggles around food. So, Ms. Pa, over to you. Thank you so much, Mary. I'm not exactly sure why my video is not showing, but I have it on. Hopefully that will resolve itself. Um, but yes, I am a MA student in the history department and chairperson of the Dos Santos residence on campus. Thank you so much to the previous um, presenters, Limpo and Kenneth. I believe that our presentations have connecting threads and hopefully will um, illuminate on some issues or different perspectives that we come from. Uh, but I would also like to thank the organizers for um, arranging this opportunity really to network and have a dialogue on addressing food insecurity and hunger, which is one of those structural silent pandemics that we face globally. Um, and in Africa, due to many factors, including poverty, climate change, a lack of investment in farming and agriculture, in exchange for urban prioritization. Um, so indeed, I believe that all of these are consequences of capitalist expansion at the expense of human life. And while it has been projected as um, you know, previously noted with what Desiree said in mass media, um, it's being projected that South Africa enjoys this food, in food security via expansive trade. But recently we saw statistics reflecting that at household levels, families and individuals do not have adequate food supply and many are living below the bread line. COVID-19 has further exposed and exacerbated um, these inequalities and economic challenges in South Africa. And UWC and institutions across South Africa do not exist in a vacuum. Many students are experiencing hunger, skipping meals, um, as has been noted, uh, Limpo mentioned that eating meals that lack adequate nutrition, which leads to malnutrition, mental, physical health deterioration. And I believe that Kenneth said that this should be through a holistic outlook um, in terms of how it affects the overall well-being um, of the student. 
So food insecurity, I believe, directly impacts students' access. <laughs> Institutionally, for those who write checks, it's regarded as retention and persistence. Um, but what this does is force many of our students, in particular postgraduates, to and particular postgraduates to juggle several part-time jobs, have the stress of studies, leading to having to make tough decisions where there's a need to feed yourself in order to survive and also all compromising your academics um, to serve a basic need unfulfilled. And I do not speak at a distance from this experience. In 2019, when I registered at UWC, it was really the first time that I faced housing and food insecurity due to the institutional barriers. And so conferences or events became an opportunity to collect a meal. Um, and a meal is always shared in a group among students who are facing these challenges together. And it was always appalling and almost degrading to witness a sort of hostility to a point where many in black were called to guard conference proceedings against hungry students. So if you see students taking food at conferences, it is not for their own performance and greed, but for those we stay at res with, homeless students, um, which when I came to UWC, uh, I, they were referred to as squatters uh, and communities we reside in. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to have a supportive department, the history department and friends that helped me through this trauma. But many do not have that support system. They are facing this in isolation alone. And many do not speak up against the suffering because to a large extent, um, as Limpo has mentioned, uh, the violence of hunger and food insecurity and so many other violence is normalized in certain spaces. And so when basic needs become a structural barrier, to students academically excelling, then it requires, I believe, institutional support where collaboration is uh, essential, not a reliance on monthly donations, which is the case right now with the Res Life Nutrition Program, because when donors are unable to provide for that month, um, like has been the case in October, there is no existing food bank with the storage facilities. So students are stranded and I believe in that case, then we fail our community, we betray our institutional values to ensuring that the well-being of our students and staff is ensured. And therefore, um, I'm part of this discussion in terms of also stating that the residential nutrition program requires a restructuring. Um, and in a time of COVID-19, we have realized how important it is to kind of expand food access to all students without lagging administrative processes um, that, as Kenneth have mentioned, becomes a poverty porn performance, having to perform your poverty to get access to food. At residence, um, there has been many interventions, student-driven interventions. The challenge remains in terms of the sustainability and the a formal institutional support that would enable these isolated projects to connect and grow. Two students at residence, uh, Mohammed Hassan, the previous Dos Santos chairperson, and Nomfunda Zwane, um, who is at the gender equity unit in 2019 used a small empty space in residence purchased seeds where they planted onions, cabbage, tomatoes, spinach, potatoes, and a, a few herbs. Um, and in a year, we really saw these vegetables flourishing and we were able to use it widely. It was used by both staff, residents, visitors. Um, but unfortunately, during the vacation period, students are asked to move to another residence. Um, whether it be for asbestos removals or maintenance. And when we returned, the garden was destroyed with debris piled all over. And since then, not much, not much has survived and the project was not revived again. Uh, and I would like to echo that there are many student struggles who fall through the interstices of systemic violences, such as food insecurity. And the institutional barriers and per pervasive cilios across department does not as assist in this matter. Therefore, it's critical to think about a collaborative forum that will keep track of the food project, ensure that there's research, there's consultations and feedback that is continuous to improve and that resources be allocated because almost always we uh, house committees of stu student leaderships like the SRC, CHD, they prioritize um, you know, uh, food security type of budgets, um, but still it's happening in isolation and it's not sustainable and therefore a sustainable praxis, I believe, needs to be built into this form of like ethical considerations that we want to take um, forward. 
And I also want to say that um, food projects should not be left to partisan, small partisan political structures, such as the SRC, because these structures are in unsustainable and ultimately serve their own constituents. So it doesn't take the project forward to grow. Um, and it doesn't have a particular student driven focus, um, you know, which I believe as, as uh, Kenneth has echoed, um, emphasizing students uh, involvement, staff involvement in, in a sort of holistic project will undoubtedly generate greater awareness. And um, therefore I echo that uh, the project proposed by Sizwe, um, who hopefully will be joining us and Kenneth is a great initiative to promote a sustainable living um, and promote well-being amongst uh, campus community. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you, Mishka. Um, you know, there's a lot of food for thought amongst this whole conversation as it is already. And I am burning with some questions and comments. But before that, we move on to Fun Milola Adieni, who is a lawyer with wide ranging interests in social justice issues and is currently a researcher at the Dalla Uma Center at UWC. Here she, is, she, here she coordinates the Access to Food for Students project. It is a national project for addressing food insecurity. And Fun Milola is also attentive to the gender implications of food rights and struggles. And in the recent years, she has worked hard to raise general awareness and action for addressing students' hunger on university campuses. For example, organizing food uh, panel discussions, scholarship, and accessible rights. So, from Lola, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. And um, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for to the coordinators of this dialogue, I think it's very critical that we keep the conversations alive. Like Prof. Hames had mentioned, over the past three years, the Doloma Institute has been actively involved in an advocacy project on the right to food for students within tertiary institutions. What we've done is to take a um, a, a, a general overview from a national perspective, trying to drive advocacy to address student hunger, because we believe that um, the, the most responsibility lies with the state. This is not to say that other stakeholders do not come to the table or do not bear some form of responsibility, but we believe that driving the response to student hunger within tertiary institutions in South Africa should start from the state at a national level. Today, I just want to pose some questions to us in our discussion. Much of my presentation will come from a legal perspective, but trying to marry the legal perspective with much of what has been said, and you see those connecting dots through it all. And the first question or the first um, thing I would like to place on the table is this disjuncture in thinking of food as a right. In my experience on working on issues around the right to food, I find that most people can think of so many other things as a right. You can think of the right to dignity, you can think of the right to freedom, you can think of the right to speech. In fact, many people are educated enough at that level to think of things around health as a right. But when it comes to food, the actual thinking or conceptualization of food as a right, most people think of food more as a commodity than as a right. And that disjuncture actually has a domino effect of making people detach themselves from actually claiming their right to food from the stakeholders that are responsible for ensuring that the right to food is fulfilled. Now, bringing it down to the institutional level, food and conversations around food started off from where most universities or, or the general perception out there was, if you're within a tertiary institution, then at the very basic level, your most important needs such as food, such as shelter, 
have been sorted and so students cannot be hungry until a couple of years ago, um, about a decade ago, where there's been a lot of movement towards researching what are the needs of students. And, and it's been described so far as the skeleton within universities cupboard. Now the conversation has moved from there and the current conversation is um, hunger is part of the experiences of being within tertiary institutions. Oh, we also experienced that kind of hunger. We also experienced food insecurity. Why should it matter now? And my response to that usually is the fact that something has gone on for many years doesn't necessarily make it right. The fact that a violation has continued over the years doesn't necessarily mean that there shouldn't be redress right now. And so the question is, why should we begin to conceptualize food as a right? Beyond thinking of food as a commodity, why do we need to think of food as a right? And why do we generally need a rights-based approach when we begin to speak about student hunger within campuses? First, because just as Kenneth had said, you can't divorce the issue of food and of hunger from a lot of other social issues. The right to food is so intrinsically linked to so many other foods, even the core right to life. A person definitely can't survive without food. Um, there is an example I usually give when I'm lecturing on this model where I say there's been a young boy of about 14 years old who committed a certain offense and the tribal council has two, one of two um, responses. One, either he's going to be locked up, which means a denial of his right to freedom, but he will be given food for the rest of his life. It's a grievous offense. Or the second um, option of a response to his offense is that he would be allowed to go, but he cannot touch any food. He can't be given food. No one can offer him food. He's not allowed to go into farmland. And a couple of weeks ago, we debated that a lot in class and, and came to the consensus that you really cannot divorce food from your very core existence as a human. And so it should definitely be entrenched within a rights framework. Also, Thinking of food as a right creates the accountability framework. It creates that framework whereby people can say, this is a rights violation. Who is responsible for this violation? And how can I ensure that this violation does not continue? Again, it also brings to the spotlight the needs of vulnerable groups, vulnerable groups like students. Also, because within the human rights framework, the needs of vulnerable groups are many times prioritized over the needs of others. And you've seen the South African government do this for several other groups that have been identified over the years as vulnerable. You have children, you have old people who have grants, you have the child grants, you have disability grants. But when you think of the demographics of those who make up students. Those are people who are totally cut off from all sorts of funding from the state or aid from the state. You also think that these are people who came from backgrounds where they had access to food, so to speak, in the form of the National School Nutrition Program. And then that access is suddenly cut off the minute they walk through the gates of the university. And so why have they not been put on the spotlight as a vulnerable group. Also the fact that the right to food is constitutionally guaranteed for all within the context of the constitution in South Africa. But the question remains, if this is a constitutionally guaranteed right, why then do we sit with these high levels of hunger currently within our university campuses? First, students continue to be an unrecognized vulnerable group. And so why does it matter that student food insecurity should matter? If we look at the demographic of students, I've said this before, who are food insecure is generally directly related to the historically disadvantaged backgrounds and the systemic inequality of students. Students are food insecure because they come from food insecure backgrounds. Simple. A student that comes from a background that is food secure is not likely to come into the tertiary institution and be food insecure. 
So the question then is, are we really serious about addressing poverty and addressing um, inequality within the context of, of, of society generally? Because if we cannot make the link between student food insecurity and students' outcomes and, ac and academic performance, and students having the education to be able to break the cycle of poverty, then I'm not sure we're even beginning to address food insecurity. And, and, and that's where we need to, that's how we need to begin to revisualize how we contextualize student food insecurity. It goes beyond just giving students food. It goes to the core nature of the development of this nation. It goes into also moving people from poverty and inequality to a point where they're able to break cycles of inequality over generations. Now, there have been a lot of statistics that have come. It, it, it's been about a decade now. First thing, as a disclaimer, I'll say there isn't enough research to contextualize the problem yet. The kind of research that we currently have is research that is very campus specific. So for instance, UKZN has some research. The University of the Free State has some research. In 2018, VIT did some research. UWC has some research in that regard. But there's also a lack of harmony in how this research is carried out. What, how, how is food insecurity across the various campuses measured? What are the statistical measurements across various? Nevertheless, it does paint a picture. It paints a picture as to the extent of food insecurity across different campuses, but it also paints a picture as to the demography of those who are likely, most likely, to be food insecure. And what the research says so far is, number one, being Black, predisposes you to food insecurity. Number two, being a student on financial aid predisposes you to a higher level of food insecurity than students who are actually not on financial aid. And this speaks to the first speaker's presentation also. Last year in 2019, a study came out from UKZN which showed that vulnerability to food insecurity was more prevalent with NASFAS funded students. 48.1 of NASFAS funded students on that campus had no food due to a lack of resources. 39.6 of those students went to bed hungry. 28% of them stayed hungry the whole day, the whole night, some more than a day. The question then is what exactly is wrong with the current structure of funding that makes students who are funded more predisposed to food insecurity? And so there are different roles for different people, but allow me to contextualize it that the state bears primary responsibility for ensuring food and nutrition security of everybody in South Africa. And when I say the states, this responsibility cuts across all levels, all spheres of government, from national to provincial to local. They, different, they have different levels of responsibility, but the most responsibility lies at the epicenter with the national government. Now, the absence of an enabling environment continues to ensure that violations of the right to food continues, and specifically within the context of tertiary institutions. And what do I mean by that? Now, South Africa is one of the few constitutions, South African constitution is one of the few around the world that guarantees socioeconomic rights in its constitution. So you have the right to life, you have the right, sorry, the right to food, the right to water, the right to health, those are constitutionally guaranteed. Now, of all the socioeconomic rights that have been constitutionally guaranteed, only the right to food has no legislation to these dates, no specifically dedicated legislation. Yes, we can argue that there are policies here and there that touch on different aspects of the right to food. But what the absence of legislation does is that it leaves a gap in the accountability mechanism. So there is a denial on the right to food or there are violations on the right to food. Who do we approach? My experience when we started the Access to Food for Students project, it was rather very funny, was trying to approach departments and asking 
who do we bring this discussion to? Is it the Department of, of Higher Education? Is it DAF? Is it the Department of Social Development? And we, for almost a year, we had this run around where the one department will say no, even though it concerns students, it's issues around the right to food. So you go to the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Agriculture says, no, this doesn't fall within our framework. Go to the Department of Social Development. And the Department of Social Development in turn says, actually, no, um, where, where whatever concerns students goes back to the Department of Higher Education. And the question is, who bears that responsibility? Now, the state is one of, many, uh, of, uh, one of many stakeholders. There are many other stakeholders who bear some sort of responsibility in ensuring that students' right to food should be guaranteed. Tertiary institutions are at the middle of this. And the duty of institutions towards success and learning outcome of its students cannot be overemphasized. However, experience continues to show a lack of support from university management across the country. And on the one hand, while we can say they should take up um, a better role, a lead role in ensuring these issues are addressed, one must also be cognizant of some of the internal issues they also face. One, funding constraints. And so the University of Western Cape, for instance, today says no student will be hungry on our campuses. The question is, how do they fund that? Secondly, the reluctance of many administrations to overstep their, their duties and their roles at national departments and the politics that plays into that also comes to bear. However, that doesn't excuse the fact that tertiary institutions should take a lead role in addressing this. And I think Mark's presentation will speak more to this. However, I just think that I should touch on some ways in which I think that universities can intervene. First, the structure of food outlets on campuses. What type of food outlets do we have on campuses? What kinds of food do they sell? What are the tender processes that ensure that X, Y, Z has access to sell food on campus, but B, C, D doesn't have that same kind of access? Who sells what on campuses? Also, the cost of food at institutions are specifically at historically disadvantaged universities. I think it's very interesting that I can get food cheaper at UCT than I can get food at UWC. And I think a lot comes to play there. And, 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 and university administrations need to begin to ask themselves certain questions. What are the demographics of our students? How much can our students, how many students, in fact, how many staff can actually afford going to Vida Cafe on UWC campus every day of the week for a whole month? and eating breakfast and lunch, not even breakfast, lunch, dinner, there. Also, the charity-based food bank. So what we've seen within universities is that there are these organizations around charity-based food banks where people can access food, and you have it across institutes, across departments, and those are great for as a stopgap measure. However, they do not address the root causes of food insecurity on our campuses in the longer term. And the question also goes to their sustainability. So for instance, a student has been used to accessing food through those systems and the lockdown happens. The question is what happens to that student? The campus food environment is also something that university administration need to take into consideration. Most of the kinds of food on our campuses today are not healthy meals. They're not the kind of foods that we should be encouraging people to eat on a regular basis. And I think that needs a lot of auditing around all campuses nationwide. Now, there's also the private sector. And there's always this leaning towards absenting the role of the private sector when it comes to student food insecurity. But I disagree with it because Tertiary institutions are a huge market base for the private sector. And so any discussion on ensuring the right to food of students are guaranteed must include the private sector. 
The cost of food generally in South Africa is unsustainable, it's extremely expensive. And the question is, should students be purchasing food at the same cost as someone who works and who earns? Best practices from other jurisdictions, for instance, have shown us that many um, big chain supermarkets have discount days for students, where students are able to purchase food at marginally cheaper, sometimes actually more than marginally cheaper rates than the general population. Also, there's also the monopolization of big food companies at institutions. So you find a lot of the smaller scale um, stakeholders and them all moving out of campus generally, as you begin to find the bigger supermarkets having more and more dominant presence on campus. The question is to whose advantage? Is this to the advantage of students who have to now purchase food at higher rates? Or is this just to the advantage of the look of campus? How does the private sector repurpose its waste? And I think this is a conversation that we need to streamline into into this discussion when we're talking about students' access to food. South Africa wastes one third of its food currently between farm and plates, from production to plates. The question is, is there a way that food could, that wasted food could be repurposed safely to feed students in need? Civil society is also another very important stakeholder, and they play a multiplicity of roles. Generally, they should be a watchdog for the fulfillment of rights. There's need for greater education and awareness on the right to food. We, within the context of the university, we might probably be aware that we have the right to food. Go into the communities and ask people whether they are aware about something called their right to food. And there's a depth of awareness. And so the question is, what is civil society doing? Even as academics, are we just publishing for the sake of publishing? Or are we finding the spaces for activism within our publishing? Hold also, civil society should take better, a, 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 more, a more heightened role in holding the state to account through interventions like advocacy, such as the Doloma Institute has been doing, submitting petitions, litigating. I was one of those who was very, very excited about the equal education case that came up during the lockdown on the National School Nutrition Program. And fair enough, um, that case was decided in favor of equal education. And it was a case that spoke basically to the right to food of children during the lockdown. And the fact that the fact that there was a lockdown did not mean that the Department of Basic Education ought to have stopped the National School Nutrition Program. So the question is, are we not supposed to be finding spaces or finding inspiration also from that case to push the agenda for the right to food of students within the context of tertiary institutions. Lastly, students are stakeholders also, and they must continue to center themselves and move away from the ideology of just being recipients of food to being rights bearers of food and claiming that right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really um, a lot to think about uh, and, and, and really unpacking what rights mean and, and have diverse opinions around that. Um, so before we, I just want to make sure whether CSRA has joined us or not. And if, and if not, then we go over to Mark Vecherif, and uh, he's a lecturer in development studies at the University of Pretoria with three decades of experience of working on human rights issues. His research and intellectual activist experience on agrarian reform and food rights informs his efforts to increase public engagement around the food rights and struggles of South African university students. 
his activities here include the writing and co-writing accessible articles and speaking on public platforms. So Mark, enlighten us, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for all the other inputs. I will try not to repeat um, things that have been said and hope I add a few new thoughts that might be useful. And the title for this uh, panel was looking at what do students eat? And it made me think about, you know, well, what could we dream about students eating? There's what students eat now, but what could we really hope for students to be eating? And then, of course, what is the role of the university in bringing about uh, this dream of what students really could be eating? And of course, eating is about health and nutrition qualities of the food that we eat. It's essential for our healthy and full lives. Um, but I think it's also about the health of the wider society. And we have to think, what does our food spend as individuals and as universities? What does our food spend support? And I think too often at the moment, the food system and the main actors in it are, as Fun Melona was, I think, indicating, narrowly driven by this desire to maximize profits. And this is part of a wider food system problem. What we've seen over the last years and decades is an increasing concentration of ownership in our food systems by large corporations, by investors. And food is treated just as another commodity from which uh, to profit, not as when Milola was indicating as a right, but simply as an asset for profit. And, and this has now come into our universities as well. And where we see universities sort of privatizing food and moving from food halls to private restaurant chains coming in and so on. And what this is leading to is a, a reinforcement of existing inequalities. The elite and the wealthiest are benefiting around the world. And we should realize that, I mean, some of the chains that are in our universities, these are part of sometimes international uh, companies as well. It's not just a local issue, we're part of a wider global food system. And this is reinforcing existing class, race, and gender inequalities. So I think for now, students, if they're lucky enough to afford it, are kind of drink, drinking the corporate unhealthy Kool-Aid and meals. They're eating over protest foods. They're eating products that provide profits to corporation while plying us with far too much sugar, far too much salt and fat. Um, and too many students can't even afford this and are simply undernourished, depriving them, of course, of their ability to fully benefit, not just from education, but the whole university experience, which should be a social experience as well for many students who have enough food. It's just where they learn drama or they become good at sports and so on. So students who are not getting enough nutrition are deprived of that whole experience. And let's just also remember this, there's a double burden here. There's the pure undernourishment, but also there's this increasing obesity. And of course, again, this is in the wider society and in the university. You know, as Dimpo said, you know, universities are a community within a community. Um, but I, I would argue that the university is not only influenced by the wider community, but it also influences and or at least has the potential to influence that as well. At the moment, we seem to be just following the same kind of trends of unhealthy food, of growing corporate domination and profiteering from food. Um, so let's have a look at the, the current situation. I don't think I have to elaborate more. Uh, a number of the previous speakers have talked about it, but just to emphasize, I mean, this is a serious situation. And one of the things that always just strikes me is the, the sort of psychological pressure students are under. They are under that pressure anyway, going into exams, having to meet assignment deadlines and so on. I see it as a lecturer. And now if you are also struggling to get food, you're not sure where your next meal is coming from. I mean, I, I find it almost incomprehensible, the psychological pressure that many students are under if they are really not even sure where food is coming from. So we know how much that is going to impact on their performance and benefit from university life. And the, the, the current responses are just not adequate across most universities. I mean, we haven't seen enough you know, research on these responses, but generally we're seeing inadequate responses that don't meet all student needs that are sometimes unreliable based purely on charity and often delivering poor quality food, lack of fresh produce, and we're just into this uh, you know, tinned foods and so on. And there's still this stigma around it. So certainly at, at University of Pretoria, you know, I, I find one of the things I find odd when we talk about stigma is that we've become very good at talking about counseling services. And when you arrive at the university, you're told, here's counseling services, please use it. And it's, you know, it's quite open and you'll even see like posters around campus saying, you know, about free counseling services. And I think that's great. 
But we don't see anything like that about food. We seem to now be in a situation where being hungry carries more stigma than carrying emotional and, and mental challenges and so on. And so, so people are, not, are simply not told about what is available and what is available is inadequate anyway. I'm, I'm not sure if there's other people from University of Pretoria on the call. Um, but, and, and so we've, we've seen cases where people have been referred to the, the student nutrition assistance program that is there from the clinic uh, on the campus, literally malnourished, literally undernourished, and the, going to the clinic for assistance and the clinic saying, but you're undernourished and then referring them to the student nutrition assistance program that they'd never heard of before. And as I say, even what they get there then isn't adequate. I'm not trying to knock the efforts. I mean, it's good to make those efforts, but we have to be clear that they're not adequate at the moment. So what I would wish students would be eating is healthy, nutritious food, but also so food that is produced by small scale black farmers, food that is produced using agroecological practices that regenerate soils rather than depleting soils, food that is produced and processed in a way that is socially and ecologically sustainable and resilient. I would wish we'd be acquiring food from a food system that from production to processing and to the distribution is much more equitable than our current food system, creating more economic opportunities. And, and I would dream of a day when students are eating food that creates you know, a healthy mind in a healthy body, in a healthy society. And we're not going to get that food system on our campuses without also engaging the wider food system that we sit within. It is about personal choices and we can all work on improving our personal choices, but it's very much also about the food system that we sit in, the food environment that's created. Um, so responses to student hunger need to go far beyond just giving students who are going hungry um, some food. It needs to go into addressing wider food system change and where the universities can play a key role in that. And we need to certainly move beyond this privatization of food to recognize it as a right and a responsibility and a public good. So I would say, urge us to look at food in universities in three main ways. One is food in the life of the university. One is food in the work of the university. And the third is the role of university around food in the wider society. So if we take the first one, food in the life of the university, this is obviously on our campuses and in our residences and so on, where we have to look at what is available, what we eat, how it is prepared uh, and the social arrangements and life around food. Do we have cooking facilities in our dormitories? Many don't. Uh, what kind of companies are, uh, and food is so, uh, sold on campus as Fun Malola was also saying and what cooking facilities are available. We have to create a good food environment in our residences and on campus. And if we can do that, we're going to influence the wider society. We're gonna have students who've had years of experience of this good food environment. And I believe we'll take some of that back into their homes and into the wider society and their future work. Now, the work of the university is about generating knowledge and it's about teaching primarily. So it's the research and the teaching that we do. And we need to do much more about food. We need to be using that work of the university to change understandings of the right to food. That means doing more research and doing more teaching. <clears throat> I, I would love to see us teaching much more about food sovereignty and the other options that are out there, not just reinforcing the current dominant corporate system. And we need to integrate these into the to courses. I would love to see food studies courses in our universities, and maybe we can collaborate as academics around that. And it takes a bit of time, but we should really see in South Africa a strong food studies course that would cover the right to food, food sovereignty, and also a critique of the current food system. And so that's a task we can take away. And if we can address these things in our teaching in the universities, we are going to again contribute in the wider society. So coming to that, uh, food and the role of the university in society, the university is part of society and we won't be able to solve the problems of food in isolation from that society. So we need to embrace that role. We need to, we heard, I mean, Kenneth mentioned the need for land for food gardens and we have that space on many of our campuses, but even beyond our campuses, quite a lot of our universities, especially the, the previously advantaged like UP, we have farms, we have a we have a experimental farm, we have a farm in Pretoria and uh, Broncosprate apparently, and I think other land. What are we doing with that land? What are we promoting on that land? Are we making that available for small scale black farmers? Are we promoting sustainable farming practices? Not at the moment, so I wish uh, we could. But in the past, if we look at the history, you know, University of Pretoria has a dairy and apparently students 
back in the day used to get fresh milk from the dairy of the university. Couldn't we sort of reestablish some of those practices rather than bringing in uh, clover milk and so on? And we have to use the buying power of the university to support a different kind of food system, as I said, to support land reform, to support black farmers, to support uh, emerging farmers, those using agroecological practices. So if, um, yeah, if students leave the university with this ex different experience of food on campus and in residences, they can really be contributed to change. If we use our buying power to support food system transformation, we can contribute to that change that will benefit the wider society and the university. But we know that that is not easy. And it also requires changing our own attitudes to food. Food is so often looked down on. And I've heard a number of um, experiences on different campuses. And we heard one from uh, earlier on in this talk from one of our, sort of Mishko, I think, uh, about a garden that was there, but then got destroyed. At UP, there was apparently gardens in the past that stopped. And I think for many students as well, we have to face the reality, gardening and growing our own food is looked down on. So how do we change that sort of attitude as well and really embrace food as an important contribution in society, embrace the production of food as that contribution, and embrace you know, eating well as a good thing to do in society. Why can't we have food sovereignty movements on every campus? I think there's one at BITS. There's certainly not one at UP. I don't know about at UWC, but I would love to see food sovereignty movements on all of our campuses. And these must be focused on democratizing our food system, taking it away from a corporate food system that is focused on profits to one which is under the control and in the hands of eaters and producers of food. And um, we need, why not branches of the slow food movement? It's become a global movement in well over 100 countries around the world. And it's embracing a different approach to food that values food, values our food cultures. So there's a lot we can be doing on our campuses. And clearly we need to do it because the change is not gonna happen without campaigns. Campaigns that I think students need to play a central role in. I think academics need to play a supportive role and an active role in this as well. So we need campaigns that would change our own mindset and attitude around food and what is good food that would go beyond the branding of the corporations. And just to note that food companies are some of the biggest spenders on advertising in the world. So our beliefs and attitudes about food is not an accident that we are turning to McDonald's or to KFC, even though they are selling us very unhealthy food. It is it's billions of dollars spent promoting exactly this kind of thing. So we need to challenge that with our own organizing, changing the discourse around food. And of course, we're gonna to have to challenge our universities and the government to create a, a good food environment on our campuses. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you very much. I think all of these um, contributions have actually linked with each other and raise some important questions. Um, I'm giving over to Desiree now to do some kind of analysis. I don't know why, Mary. You said you're giving up. I just want to thank speakers because what I found so refreshing about the discussion is the emphasis on contexts and analysis. Uh, because I think very often the temptation is, and Mary and I have been doing some research on the research into hungry, on hungry students. And the emphasis is so much on identifying these hungry students and coming up with welfareist uh, philanthropic solutions to fix the problem that is sort of seen out there. And of course, these, this is hugely problematic as everybody else has said uh, um, about this. I, there, there's so many things. Um, I do know that, I think it's Rondeline. Rondeline, are you still there? She had uh, quite a few questions she wanted to raise. But before she raises that, I want to pick up on something that was surfaced by all the speakers and it's in the subtitle of this panel discussion, which is the whole question of complicities and the university's role. Um, although Fun Milola said that, you know, the state needs to be made accountable. Um, she also acknowledged as everybody else did that the university does have a role to play. And I'm just wondering what speakers feel about the way in which the university is currently South African universities are currently very concerned with branding and food cultures are sort of central to this branding. 
um, and the way in which very often the student ventures, student activism is um, drowned out in this emphasis on creating a, an image of the university as a global middle-class institution. Um, so yeah, if, if people could maybe comment on that, I think Dumbo started to, but maybe she might want to say a bit more. I don't want to take up all the space because this is after all supposed to be an interactive platform. Um, Rondaline, are you around yet? Then maybe we can take a question from you. Yes, she is there. Can you speak? Or do you want me to read your question? Hi, good Hi. afternoon, Desiree. Hi, thank you so much. I just really want to say um, thank you to all of the speakers firstly for what they've shared with us. And it's such a valuable information. Um, I have I have a few questions, yes. And um, I think my questions are mostly to uh, um, I, I want to know, um, based on what you said, should we say or can we highlight that there's a direct link between the success of a student and a country's economy? And I think all of the speakers have touched on this, saying that um, the success of a student or without being food secure, um, you can't really take away the fact that um, it's, it's linked to a student's performance. So can we then say that there's a direct link between a student's success as well as their country's economy? And um, I'd also just like to know the gap that uh, Funmilela was, talk, was talking about. Um, what are left for students to do? Because we know that there are no uh, grants for students out there. You spoke about the fact that students are cut off um, once they go into, or once they turn 18, because now they're not, um, they don't get any more social grants or, or school feeding programs are not part of that. Um, what, what is then left for students to do? Who do we go to? Who do we approach? Is it the university? Is it the institution? Is it the government? What does the constitution say about what is left for a student or any type of vulnerable group um, for that matter? So yeah, my question is, is basically just that, yes. I'd like to have some um, insight around that. Do I respond now? Yes, please, Fulminola. I think that was okay. directed mainly at you, but we can also take anybody else's response after you. Okay. Thank you for your questions, Rodeline. Um, first, I just want to quickly touch on your earlier questions, Prof, around the issue of branding and um, universities positioning themselves in a certain kind of perception versus what's happening on ground and trying to put that behind. And for me, that is where the key role of civil society and even of academia comes in. Push out the information, because at the end of the day, you cannot necessarily task the, a university that's trying to position itself in a certain light with also, so to speak, castigating itself. So that is a key role for, the, for civil society, in my opinion, to be able to push out the narrative of this is what is truly on ground right now. And these are the issues we need to address within the whole context of this university trying to brand itself in a certain way. Rodeline, to your questions. First, you said um, the link between, highlighting the link between student success and a country's development. Oh, definitely. There have been various um, reports. I was looking at one, I think, from the OECD, commissioned by the OECD a couple of years ago, trying to trace the link between, student, between um, a country's economic development and education. And what the link generally, or a summary, is that where you find a uh, more people educated at the tertiary level, specifically in certain courses around STEM, that is debatable still, 
you find a greater level of economic activity and development within those contexts. So the question is, we need to begin to look at it more within a development context that if South Africa is serious about driving the development agenda, then it should be serious about ensuring that beyond paying for students' tuition, students are able to study in within conducive environments. Conducive environments speak to things around housing, it speaks to food, it speaks to their access to resources. So it's not enough that the state says you're not first funded with paying for tuition. Or the state says, okay, since you're not first funded, although you're not on campus, I pay for your tuition, I pay for you to get to the university. The question is, should students have to be making the choices between do I take a plate of food today or do I get to class? Those are not choices students should be making. Also with regards to what students can do, I think it's a complex question because like I had said, there is something missing. There's a gap in the accountability framework currently on the right to food. However, there are certain things that can be done. In the long term, one, I think that pressure should be put on many more chapter nine institutions. The Commission for Gender Equality, there is a gendered dimension to student food insecurity on campuses. And I think that that should be. The Duloma Institute last year presented a petition to the, chapter, um, to the South African Human Rights Commission We've been trying to follow up with that. There's not more traction in that regard, even though we send emails, we ask where it's been, the commission is still considering that. But I mean, when you look at it, that's a long-term goal. We've also been trying to interact with parliament with regards to driving policy in that regard. But in the immediate, I think the first thing that the students need to do is identify within the university structure what are the assistance programs on ground. Are there any? There is stopgap measure, all right, but in the interim, they immediately address the need for food. The only other option that students currently have, because students don't have any of the other social security nets that a lot of um, many of the vulnerable groups have is the social relief of distress grant. Now that is administered by the Department of Social Development. However, there are limitations to it. You apply, it's also another whole process for application. You apply and you're given the social relief of distress grant based on your assessment for an initial period of three months after which you're entitled to an extension of only three months extra. So in all, a period, assuming you do get that extension, is six months. A student is on campus for how long? Plus minus 10 months. So what happens to that student in, within the four months that are left? And the next year when the student comes back, what happens? So those are immediate responses. On the long term, I think the onus is on everybody from students to civil society to even academia to push for institutional change, changes right from the national level. Thank you for Milola. Um, I think that you've also touched on one reason why this hasn't been the case, why there hasn't been this kind of concerted action uh, within the campus community, because food politics somehow is not seen to be an area for everybody, a zone in which everybody is supposed to participate in rights struggles, as opposed to say struggles around gender justice or struggles against uh, racism. Um, and maybe, yeah, there the, 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 the is a need to have these kinds of conversations. One way in which we're going to try and take this forward is to open up space on the website for conversations around this, different kinds of conversations, whether these are images or essays. Um, and Lynn has just posted information about that. 
But I also want to go back, I think, to mainly to Kenneth and Mishka, because I think Cesar still hasn't been able to join us. Um, because they spoke earlier on before Fumilola and Mark spoke. Is there anything that you want to respond to that's been raised um, towards the latter half of the presentations? Kenneth, can we start with you? I think I would especially like to hear more about the food garden because there has been some critique about the idea of gardens as reinforcing the idea of the poor must be responsible for getting themselves out of poverty. But I think you are trying to, you're making an argument about a very different kind of project, which is highly politicized and which might in fact provide the foundation for a food sovereignty movement at UWC. In fact, I think UWC is ripe for a food sovereignty movement. I think we sometimes underestimate the extent as we are talking about hungry students to which students at UWC, and I know the GEU has been doing quite a lot of research and work with students around this, have actually been coming up with um, solutions to students' food access. They've been forming groups, especially women students, uh, cooking meals, well-balanced meals, and very often um, the institution and management is very hostile to this. Um, so I think that these are the kinds of initiatives that we have to think about quite carefully. Kenneth, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, and, and okay, before, before I, 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 I respond on, on, on the issue of the, the food gardens, I think uh, first I'd like to you know, say something on, 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 on the issue of university branding right uh, and and i think that there's a serious there's a serious divide between <laughs> branding branding uh, for who who's the intended audience who who is the organ the, the university branding themselves for uh, and you know by getting to who the audience is then we'll get in whose interest this brand branding is happening because also uh, I feel that uh, the universities, the branding of universities is more to, how can I say, to, to sing praise of themselves as this factory of, of, of knowledge production, but not really looking at the students who are also part of making up what, what, what then the university becomes. Because now the university in its branding, it's talked as if there's no one there that is just buildings and books, you know, there's no people, uh, students and, and lecturers that are making up uh, uh, what the university is and what it becomes and what its performance and successes internationally then become. Uh, so I, I guess for me, it's just maybe broad, broad questions on, you know, in the interest of whom are we branding uh, uh, this university says, you know, uh, factories of knowledge production. But, but just to, to, to comment also on the issue of, 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 of food gardens that we see first and foremost, like we, we don't want to be uh, people who, who are always looking for charity, who are looking to be helped. We also want to be part of, of the solution itself. And, and starting with the food garden because we also believe that in that process of starting a food garden, we'll have to organize ourselves. Where do we get the seeds? Who gets to mend the garden when, when other people are not there? And who gets to look after this process? In that organization of, of, of trying to get the food gardens uh, 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 active and actually running properly to the way that we want, uh, uh, we believe that it's in that process that we can actually think of better, uh, more solutions, better solutions to the overall problem of students within within universities. Because uh, as I've said before, that the food issue is only one part to so many struggles of students within 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 university. But food is 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 so central and 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 fundamental that it directly and indirectly also affects other parts of, of students' needs on, on, on campus. And, and 
also this thing of, of food gardens. I mean, we do have gardens right now on our universities. There are gardens all over the university, but they are just trees. I mean, they are trees that are looked after just for shade. Uh, there is nothing. Hello, hello, sorry. Can you just? Sorry about that. Uh, there are there are, there are gardens already, but these gardens they are not productive. They are not helping in terms of student access to food on on campus. But they are only only there to make the campus look nice. So some of these spaces could actually be used productively uh, 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 in the struggle for food uh, insecurity, but in the process also involve the people themselves who are uh, uh, struggling. Uh, to with food insecurity because also in the end we are the ones to to create solutions to our problems if we keep on waiting for other people to give us solutions i mean we might end up in this impasse for for another lifetime so i think on that basis yeah i would like to end there. yeah mark mentioned what we what do we dream of i think i have a dream of a a site that combines food gardens with talks, with pleasure, with all kinds of things. A, a holistic solution that is not geared towards fixing problems, but as Mark put it, I think in his last uh, set of comments, transforming the food system and transforming our sense of who we are and how we relate to each other. Because I think so often this, um, the situation is cast in terms of those who do not have, who must be fixed. Um, and, and that's not the, the, the issue. The issue is transform, to transform the system as a whole, a system in which corporate food is glorified, a system in which the Vida Cafe is welcomed on campus with open arms. And the man that used to sell the fruit very cheaply that you could go to outside the library he's nowhere to be seen because he's no longer allowed to sell his fruit there so yeah that's my ideal look uh Dimbo, i don't know if you want to pick up on anything that's been said um yes i do actually with regards to um the whole um, branding of the university in terms of their particular objective with regards to their branding. And um, usually when it comes to the investment made on the branding model, you can you can tell that the university is taking a very capitalistic approach um, that of the private sector, which makes or brings us to question, like is the universities operating as a private sector now or have they adopted the private sector model in terms of how they present their institution you know, in, in the sense of branding now? Which which would be very concerning given who, um, especially looking at the University of the Western Cape's context in terms of who they're catering for, who is the majority that they are catering for. Also, again, taking its historical context into consideration. Um, so the one thing that I would um, use as an example is that is how uh, the university managed to secure Vida Cafe onto campus. Again, looking at the type of target market, um, Vida Cafe um, focuses on outside of the University of the Western Cape. So looking at how they basically price their beverages. Then you ask yourself, okay, UWC, knowing the kind of students that attend the university, why is it that Espresso Cafe was not an option where Espresso Cafe is a, a, a coffee shop that literally sells everything for just 10 rand? everything from the, the 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 beverages to the food that they supply 10 rand and actually for quite good quality if anyone has been to express a cafe around the western cape area so it's also that the selection process and the consideration in the what i believe is a tendering process for who gets to you know provide services on campus also with regards to how students have taken initiative um, in order to, you know, assist their own from their own personal capacity, their own food insecurity. Because as um, again, Fismas Fall has brought to light as how they tried to assist a student who was selling Burovor strolls, who then got into a lot of complicated issues with the university in terms of no you can't because you're not you, can, you can't sell on um, Burovo's roles on campus even though the student was selling them in order to cover her school fees and to feed herself um told that she's not allowed to do it because she's not a registered vendor on the university of the western Cape. so it's what is the vin, um, vendor process for students who want to take their own initiative in order to um sell on campus in order to assist their financial situation but at the same time 
time um, there was this whole thing around how do students who have ideas, because the university is also um, promoting the entrepreneurship model as well within the institution, how can students who have these great ideas, who have started these, um, 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 what you call this, these um, 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 businesses um, from their own rooms in order to assist their financial situation, but also to make certain things like food accessible to other students who couldn't afford the foods at the dining hall and was more reflective of their needs and what they grew up eating as well from the communities that they come from. So that's the thing that I wanted to touch on with regards to the university's branding model and, and, and if it's, if it's a, a capitalist model that they are, are busy applying to the approach and how they do things. Um, and with regards to, um, oh yeah, I spoke basically about how students are venturing on their own in terms of their entrepreneurship to assist um, 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 their they financial situation within the university. Hopefully I'm capturing, yes, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, we can come back to you. Um, for Milola, I wonder if you want to comment here because um, Dumbo does seem to be pointing to a conflict of interest when it comes to, you know, how the university relates to food challenges and on one hand, and its need to define itself, its perceived need to define itself as a successful kind of global university, um, which is actually, as Kenneth points out, out of sync with students' needs. Um, so can we actually define the university monolithically? I don't know, it's, it's, it's in some ways a question um, that responds to, to the comment that you made towards the end. Do you want to chip in here or am I not clear enough? No, you're clear enough. Let me just circle back a bit to the beginning of my presentation and where I had stated that um, the issues around food insecurity on university campuses generally worldwide, not just in South Africa, were for a long time defined as the skeleton within universities cupboard. So I don't think that the issues around universities wanting to brand themselves as successful vis-a-vis -vis the lived realities of students within universities is new, neither is it peculiar to South Africa, so to speak. I just think also it speaks to how out of touch many university administrations are with their students on the ground and what is truly happening. It, it, it almost feels like for many university administrations is a question of this is what we want, this is how we want it, and so this is the certain look we're going to project. Um, I was recently on the food security task team of a certain university and after attending a couple of meetings, I came to the conclusion that a couple of us who were invited to join that particular food security task team were there to check boxes to check the boxes of we've consulted, we've brought in the people who work around these issues. And that speaks generally to the administration's perspective in relating with from academia to students to generally the community within the universities. How does administration relate with its university community? Is it a relationship of we said this, this is what is going to happen? Or is it truly democratic in its nature? Does it truly speak to the lived realities of so many on board. So I doubt it's an issue that's been there forever, I d which is why I'm very reluctant to place the burden of change on university administration. I don't think that's going to happen, not in the near future. It probably may happen, they will probably catch up at some point, but um, I think that that burden, we need to place it on academia and also on civil society organizations to push the narrative of what the lived realities are currently on campuses. Desiree, can I respond to your earlier question on the... Yes, uh, yeah, please go ahead. 
So I mean, I would put it in the context also of this essentially neoliberal shift, which also involves a shift shift to this sort of corporatized approach in universities, and where universities over the last decade or two have been pushed into taking a very corporate approach, where we now apply core sort of corporate models for measuring performance and so on to the whole thing and the university has to compete also in this world and there are real financial issues connected to this um, because universities increasingly have to go and seek funding to be able to do any kind of research and that means often universities turning to corporate funding and and so on and collaborations with corporations or with philanthropic capitalists who often drive a very similar kind of agenda. So these things are definitely all linked up as and the imagery that goes with that is often this modernization image, which often is one from rich northern countries. So I put in the chat line that, you know, because I was searching this Vida Cafe and and it and if Google says it's a cafe chain inspired by European street culture, you know, and this is sort of says something about what we are aspiring to or we're supposed to aspire to. And of course, I would argue we should be building African universities that are inspired by African food cultures and not just the ones that were brought by colonialism, but um, also how do we value our indigenous foods and food practices and, and the, the diets that we used to have. In a seminar we had it, uh, a week ago, uh, someone at UP working on indigenous foods was saying, you know, we've been told about this Mediterranean diet and how good it is, and it's time for us to embrace our African diet and realize how good it was or could be. We have to recreate our own imagination about what food should be and can be in Africa, in Southern part of Africa. And that goes with the branding, it goes with the imagery and whether we're chasing corporate funding and corporate food chains or we are creating our own. And so just, um, just to conclude on the, the, the financial links and the link with this corporatization, um, you know, it's quite difficult as an academic in our universities now to be very involved in trying to bring about these changes. We are measured on things like uh, outputs of publications in high-end journals, and there is no valuing, in my performance appraisal, there's no valuing of my involvement in a community project or a community student garden or anything like that. That's not value. I must publish in a high-end journal that um, maybe people don't have access to. And I think students are under a similar pressure because well, they're supposed to, you know, we're, we're supposed to churn out students who pass their exams and get their degree papers, and we don't value student activism in these things. So, so this kind of corporate approach also makes it very hard um, to even organize sometimes and challenge and build something different. But we have to try. And one thing we can do is link to these wider movements because, and I, I would just end on that because I think from that we can take lessons and we can take encouragement. Uh, you know, when when uh, when uh, Kenneth thing was talking about the trees, I was thinking of the transition movement that has promoted the planting of fruit trees and nut trees in public spaces. So plant food giving trees in gardens, not just rose bushes. You know, and we can learn from the slow food movement. We can link to the food sovereignty campaign in South Africa and internationally. And I think that can encourage us. Thanks. There's a comment from Mishka who, yeah, Mishka hasn't had a chance to come back yet. And then also Joyce, sorry Joyce, I haven't forgotten about you. Uh, Mishka, can you rather speak for yourself rather than have me summarize mm. you? Yes, thank you so much uh, Desre and the previous uh, speakers who, um, you know, I've been resonating a lot with. Um, in particular with the branding, but I want to uh, go back to, to Kenneth um, and when he spoke about, um, you know, these interventions of farming in order to get to the greater questions of food sovereignty and food systems that promote sustainable needs. And I, I invited um, an agricultural scientist, I hope he's still here at Life Sciences, Ali Ali, he's a PhD candidate who is also involved in, um, you know, the scientific approaches towards food um, in addressing food insecurity. And um, Bufaru, who is the development officer at the residential you know, system, uh, at the residential office rather. Um, so I hope that they can also contribute um, you know, from their perspectives. But the resources um, are available on campus in terms of supporting a, a food project um, as proposed by Kenneth um, and Seizwe. And so I really wanna go back to what um, 
Fumilolo said, if I'm saying that correctly, in terms of the institutional barriers, um, you know, in making this realize, so not getting locked in these sort of, you know, negotiations um, that we have to make with the institutions or lengthy dialogues, you know, that would take us another five years in terms of actually addressing this now. Um, as COVID-19 has exposed our un the unsustainable ways of capitalism and, you know, the, the academy and, um, you know, being a marketplace of ideas, but also a marketplace within the economy. So I really want to, um, you know, get back to more in terms of the the conversation around that there is not that greater awareness where students are involved, I would disagree with that because every year, um, student leadership budgets, there's a prioritization towards food, right? Especially during exams um, where students do not have meals. So I was wondering then if there are all these isolated budgets and across residents in the SRC that is made available, that is put, put as the idea of legacy projects um, which, you know, I was shocked. I imagine that, you know, basic needs on our legacy projects, um, but kind of like, you know, bringing that all together so that it's not these many silos in addressing this and it's every year just an event project, you know, that is unsustainable, um, but that these resources can be brought in to support a sort of like project where everyone can have access, whether they're on resident system, or whether they're off campus, or whether they're staff, whether they're visitors, and the surrounding communities, because if we, we walk out of here now, the only accessibilities that we have in terms of shopping is far, right? Um, and when we go out to these shops, what do we see? We see people begging on the streets. We see young children of six years old begging on the streets, right? So it's also about immersing ourselves within the community and not just thinking about, you know, small scale in terms of this is a university, but it's kind of rethinking our contribution as has been echoed within the university. Um, and so I want to go back to sort of like cautioning against that there is a need to first start with awareness. We know there is an awareness, but it's isolated. So how can we come together within a forum and not just have this responsibility on the state, have this res or seek responsibility, but actually collaborate with various departments in terms of supporting a sort of like student-driven initiative and seeing where that could expand um, and so forth. So that was just my, you know, my contribution. And I hope that Ali Ali and Mufaru could also, um, you know, bring in more sort of like context as well um, in terms of this. Thank you, Jesse. I think we might, uh, well, we will definitely have a follow up conversation um, and involve the other, other universities as well. Um, but yeah, I, th I think just the opportunity for us to talk to one another and to have a sense of what's going on. I think, Mishka, you probably have more of a sense, but even you um, seem to be confounded by the range of things that are in place that, that don't seem to be speaking to each other. Um, Joyce wanted to say something. Joyce, are you still around? Joyce? Sorry, I've got construction at my house, so. I hope that's not carrying through, not at my house, but next door. Um, Mary, are you there? I know that at the start you said you wanted to say you had quite a few questions. Yes, no, I've even sent your WhatsApp to say. Oh, um, so so I'm yeah. I'm yeah. yeah, but I, I think some of it, uh, Dumpo is covered around the military issue. But my other issue is also that I would, um, uh, Fan Milola was actually saying that the government should take accountability, responsibility. I say that the university should take responsibility and actually revisit its budget allocation to the various um, um, concerns that's, that's being raised. Um, also, like the, the whole question, and I can't, Kenneth, I, I hear you and Mishka around food gardens, etc. It is, if we, for instance, look at the UWC physical environment and the physical structures there, 
and how much space there is available. And way back, the university actually had a farm, but that I think the farm was sold. So these are kinds of things that one should take uh, in consideration. Dempo men mentioned that the university has closed down its, its, its dining hall. So now we have paid dining halls. And I think at the historically white universities, they still have dining halls. I mean, uh, um, for the first few year, number of years, we've been going, for instance, to, to Rhodes University in the now Makanda. And I mean, they were full breakfast with the students could have a choice what they wanted to eat. Now, these things are not available on our campuses. And also the whole question around access to the NSFAS and other financial aid is that we found that if we put actually a gendered lens on, it's that women who especially have children and other extended responsibilities would first, when they receive this financial aid, would send the money home because they have other responsibilities besides it. So I would actually advocate for the universities to have dining halls and number two, to have um, uh, uh, sponsored food outlets on campus where students can actually with their student cards either receive free mails or uh, against a very low cost. Um, of course, the, 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 the type of food, I mean, again, uh, um, many people have, have, have touched upon that. And I mean, um, uh, chip rolls, Gatsby's, fat cooks, etc. Et that is actually being sold on campus, but not in the mainstream uh, vending facilities. Um, we also know, for instance, uh, if you talk about students taking um, agency, it is that one of the oldest and a rather uh, was reasonably affordable food into the house was actually closed on campus and there's now an entrepreneurship project going on. And I don't know who's really going and what kind of entrepreneurship is going to be promoted then. Um, teaching students about food, there was a vibrant dietetics program on campus but you had to be enrolled in that community and health studies uh, faculty or department to actually make and have access to, to good food ideas. So, so there's so much to be said and so much to be done. Um, and like I said, our, our university has been turning into a concrete city. We so see all the parking spaces on campus and then only certain people have access to these parking spaces. But I would also uh, guard against the not greening of the, uh, of the campus for leisure and the relaxation and just have spaces to sit down. Um, so what is left of the greening of, of um, students should get on board on the physical planning structures of the university. We do not have um, and of course, the university now is actually buying buildings and in the middle of, of Belleville City, where there's not really space to have this relaxation spaces or even spaces for food gardens. And again, I agree with you this when you say, now you put the responsibility on the student to provide, where for instance, we have to make the universities accountable. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. We've run to, uh, towards the end of our time, although so much has been raised. As I said before, we, we do urgently need to take this conversation further and we'll be um, in touch with that. Um, I just want to call on the speakers. Any final words before we wrap up or provisionally, I should say provisionally wrap up. I see there's a, a question directed to Funmilola. Yeah, there's a question for me. Hi, Ramoniwe. So I'll quickly respond to that. In the absence of a legal framework on 
the right to food within South Africa beyond the constitution, I guess the easiest thing for citizens to do would be to raise the issue in court. But we all know that court processes take a while. However, um, like I had recently alluded to in my presentation, a case was brought, it was, it was, it was for an emergency declaration during the lockdown. And that has at least brought some kind of hope to just generally the right to food framework in South Africa. On the equal education case where the Department of Basic Education in several provinces except the Western Cape was taken to court on resuming the National School Nutrition Program. And the court had held there that the children's rights to food cannot be stopped during the period of lockdown, it, it, there, there was no, there was no, there was no derogation, there should have been no derogation from it, notwithstanding the lockdown. But then again, that was within a children's rights framework. But that should probably also inform us within tertiary institutions that perhaps the time is right to lodge that complaint with the courts at this point. Because if there's no right to food framework in legislation where we can say, this is where the actual accountability lies. For children in school and the National School Nutrition Program, that was very clear because the, that policy specifically put feeding of children within the context of the Department of Basic Education. So that responsibility lay there. It's not clear where tertiary institution is concerned. So we might need to turn to the court to ask for an explanation on where that lays currently. So I would say that the easiest thing, the most straightforward thing, not necessarily the easiest, would be to start off with a court case However, other soft measures which the Duluma has been exploring over the last couple of years would be trying to develop a working relationship both with parliament and with national development on trying to move the agenda for policy forward. That takes a while. That is probably something that's still going to be on for the next couple of years. I can't say how quickly they would respond to it. There seems to be increasing interest over the years, but whether that would realize in anything concrete within the next one to two years is left to see. The question is what happens to students in the interim? So I would say that I am strongly for putting this before the courts and asking the courts to decide on this as urgently as possible. Thank you for that. Uh, any other quick final words? We have run over time. I can but come with final, final words for me is that I think in this world, we face a crisis of growing inequality, a crisis of climate change and environmental destruction. And the food system is very much part of that. Whether we have a corporate food system that is driving profits, inequality and environmental destruction, or we build a different food system that is creating, uh, that is building a better society that is regenerating our ecology, is re re restoring our environment. So this is a this is a crisis of the world faces, South Africa faces, and students uni and universities face. So universities and students can play a really important role in bringing about a different kind of food system, and one that meets their needs, and uh, but also contributes to this. Uh, meeting this challenge of sustainably feeding our world population in a healthy way. So thanks very much for having me and for and thanks my thanks to the other speakers. Thank you. Anybody else? Kenneth? Because I think your your um, ideas resonate very much with Mark's. Any final words? <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, um, oh, you got it. No. Okay. okay. Anybody else? No, then I want to just say thank you to everybody. It's been an extremely energizing conversation, um, something that we really have to take forward. And of course, there have been similar conversations elsewhere. And yeah, it's time for us to kind of start joining the dots and take things further. 
Um, Mary, thank you very much uh, for co-moderating. And yeah, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day. And I'll be in touch with the presenters. Bye. Thank Bye. you. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thanks a lot.